So one aspect of that that I wanted to briefly touch on in this khutbah is getting our daughters married. So this applies in, in any situation, but this is one thing that I wanted to touch, touch with you today, is getting our daughters married. First and foremost, Allah says that the sharia that He gave us, the law that He gave us, the purpose of it is to make our burden light. Yuridullahu liyukhaffifa ankum. That Allah wants to lighten the burden from you. So cultural burdens, cultural burdens can be very, very heavy, right? Like for example, you have a family and you've got three daughters, four daughters, and you have this cultural standard that the oldest daughter should get married first. Then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. You created this standard. Allah didn't reveal this standard, you have this standard, good for you. But then the second daughter, not the fourth daughter, the second daughter is getting a proposal, and a good proposal. And you say, no, 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 you got to wait, because there's a line, get back in line, right? And so when you do that, you, you, now let's look at it from a Qur'an point of view, something came that was halal, and your daughter wanted it, she had the right to be married, and you denied her something that was halal for her. Even the Prophet of Allah was told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Why do you make haram what Allah has made halal? Like even the Prophet wasn't allowed to do that in, a, in the smallest of things. This is not a small thing, this is a life thing. And you can devastate somebody because they wanted to marry a person, they had an emotional attachment, they had the thought of this is the right person for me, and you deprive them from getting married, they end up getting married somewhere else. This person has, you know, deep depression, they have, they have anger towards their parents, then they have anger towards the religion, because now their parents told them you must obey your parents, this is why you cannot get married. They use, remember I told you they use parts of the religion? So they use parts of the religion to beat up on this poor girl, and she can't have what, what Allah has given her, her, her the right to have as an individual adult. And that's the next thing I want to say. When our daughters are about to get married, they're not children, they are adults. And adults are going to stand on their own in front of Allah on Judgment Day. You are not going to come in front of your 28-year-old daughter and say, Ya Allah, ask me the questions. She's, uh, I'm her wali. No, she, she's answerable for herself on Judgment Day. And if she committed a crime in this life, ma'adullah, if she cut a red light, or you know, if she, if, if she stole money, she, you're not going to stand in front of her. She has to answer for herself in the court of law in this life and in the court of Allah's law on Judgment Day. She's an individual with personal responsibility. On top of all of that, especially for those of us, because the world is changing, right? Economies are changing. Many people, like in my family, for example, even, it, it was hard to make ends meet. Everybody worked. My mom worked, my dad worked, my sisters worked. I were, everybody had a job because there was no way to survive. It's expensive. So there are situations where we trust our daughters to go get a job. We trust our daughters to go to the university. We trust our daughters to earn a living for themselves, to be out on their own. You're not standing there at work next to her. You're not protecting her every second. She's taking care of herself. She's carrying herself in a dignified way on you, and you trust her. So that same daughter that you trust to go out into the world, the same daughter that you trust to get, get her an education, when that same daughter says, I think this person may be a good choice for me for marriage, right? And you say, no, 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 that's not how we do things in the tribe. That's not how we do things in our village. We have, a, we have a system in place. If your system was so great, what are you doing here? If your system worked, why didn't you raise your daughter in that old system? You recognized something was missing, and you crossed an ocean, and you put your children, I put my daughters into a different culture, a different society, a multicultural, multi-ethnic society, an open society, and now they're supposed to hold on to their Islam, which is tough enough. But on top of that, they need to hold on to your village culture too. This is an imposition. This is a burden that you put on top of them that Allah didn't put. And that, what does it do in the end? At the end, we have to understand what this does. A society that gets destroyed, a society that gets ruined, is a society in which the door to halal gets smaller and smaller, and the door to haram gets bigger and bigger. So haram becomes easy and halal becomes difficult. When earning halal money becomes difficult, then that society is heading towards destruction. When being in a halal relationship is difficult, then that society is heading towards destruction. 
This Now the thing is, the Israelites had done that to themselves. And Allah says, when He gave them the book, وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ That Allah removed from them their chains and the fetters that used to be on them. Meaning they were like imprisoned by their own culture. They were making things so hard on themselves because of their self-imposed standards that they were actually imprisoned and burdened and crushed by it. They were crushed by it. I, I'm, I'm remembering even, and, and I'm sure you have your own examples from your own cultures, but for example, in some cultures, if you're going to have a wedding, it has to be a really lavish wedding. And if you're going to have a mahr, that mahr should be so big that if somebody hears about it, they fall off their chair. Right? Otherwise, you know, what, mahr's got to be some serious. And then on the other side are people that weaponize some random athar and say, no, 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 you should just give a, a date. Or mem- have her memorize Surah Al-Ikhlas, that should be good enough mahar if she has iman and taqwa. Stop being ridiculous. This wasn't the mahar of everyone. Like the, we, we, we turned the religion into a joke. right? So either I'm going to give her a Kit Kat bar for mahar, or, <laughs> or I'm going to give her four times my life savings, and you know, 30 years later I still am not able to pay the mahar. Mahar is not a joke. What we've done in our cultures is we've turned the mahar into a trophy. How much was it? How much was it? Like when, when the wedding happens, everybody says, so how much, how much did you get? How much did you get? What's the amount? What's the amount? Oh, now when my daughter's getting married, we better have twice that amount. We, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a race for hierarchy, right? So we take something Allah has given that makes life easy, and we've turned it into this way of putting social status and created even more difficulty. Now the guy that doesn't have $80,000 or $150,000 because he just graduated, just got his job, he, he's either got to agree to this, this marriage mortgage, or, or he can't get married. Or he'll agree to it with the intention that he's not going to pay it. Well, it's just a number, don't worry about it. How is it just a number? This is the word of Allah. You can't just make a joke out of that. I'll just tell her later, you, don't, you love me, right? Can you take a couple of zeros off? You know, like, <laughs> this is what happens when the culture imposes standards that are so hard that they're humanly impossible. They're unrealistic. And what do we associate with that? We associate respect with it. If you don't have a high number, if you don't have an unrealistic number, then what respect does your family have? وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Dignity, respect. That comes from Allah, it belongs to Allah, it belongs to His Messenger, it belongs to those who believe. This is, we create these false standards of respect, and then we bury ourselves, and we bury our daughters, we bury them, you know. And then there, there, there are other situations.